Hey guys, it's me again, Kamer Rückert from the Psychosomatic Student Group Riga. Today's student lecture will be more on the psychotherapy part of psychosomatic medicine. We already took a look at the history, the pathophysiology, the theories and the defense mechanisms. Now we take a look at the personality of humans and how psychoanalytic or psychodynamic psychotherapy categorizes patients. For this lecture, I worked with Nancy McWilliams' book, Psychoanalytic Diagnosis. McWilliams starts her chapter with a joke. Her friend, who does not believe in psychotherapy, divides people into nuts or not nuts. McWilliams jokingly replies, we do the same. We just ask how nuts and nuts in what way. Because after all, we're, at the, we're all on a personality spectrum and hopefully we are on the neurotic side. Her question, how nuts, can be interpreted as the spectrum of personality. According to modern psychoanalysis, and especially those who Otto Kernbeck's transference-focused therapy appeals to most, follow this classification. The personality can be found on a spectrum seen on this slide. Neurotics on the healthier and psychotics on the unhealthy end. Borderlines, as the name already suggests, are somewhat caught in the middle. There are neither neurotics nor psychotics. We will go through each of these personality types in a minute. McWilliams nuts in what particular way refers to the personality type. Each of the three mentioned before can be organized with a personality type. Though many personality types often coexist, usually one predominates. You can find paranoid or narcissistic neurotics, as well as schizoid or paranoid psychotics. Depressive borderlines may occur too. As you can already see, what adds to a personality is complex and its formation is multifactorial. They already, we already learned the theories of psychosomatic disorder that may contribute to personality types, as well as genes. Keeping um, this in the back of the mind, do you think psychotherapy could come up with a unique therapy system for all patients? Because so far, what I have taken from psychosomatic theories myself is the message that we're all unique in our own way and our treatment needs to be adjusted to us uniquely. And because personalities are so complex, we need to find a way to diagnose each personality and the spectrum. Five entities are commonly used in the formation of a personality. Identity asks, asks the important question, who am I? Most of us have one or two answers right away and can add a couple more after a while. You somewhat know your place in society and who you are. But for some people this question is a real problem. Beside your gender and sexual orientation, a much more profound question could be doubting your own existence. Do I exist right now? Is a senseless question to most of us, yet an impossible one for others. Eric Erikson defines identity as having a conscious sense of self, which develops through social interactions. It may change due to, so, due to social stages, but I am what I am still remains. People without very early social interactions often struggle with this question. Defense mechanisms do not define our personality by being present or not, because we all use them, and it is impossible to lack them. They tend to become pathological when they are not used in a variety. When we rigidly stick to the same mechanism, life becomes harder to deal with. Another tool in categorizing defense mechanisms is whether they are primary or secondary, whether they are immature or mature. Neurotics tend to use immature as well as mature defense mechanisms, while the others only use immature ones. The object relation is the relation to our early attachment figures. Did we properly internalize the good and the bad parts of our mothers and fathers? Do we identify with them or do we not? Object relation, as well as inner conflicts, are already a huge topic and will be the topic of two lectures in the future. To make it short, 
conflicts refer to a fight between two opposing and incompatible motives, motives or wishes. Autonomy versus dependency, submission versus control, or being cared for versus independence. More about that in the last lectures. And last but not least, the contact with reality, which is a self-explanatory item. It is the, patient, is the patient in contact with reality? Are the stories or memories in touch with reality? So let's take a look at the neurotics or the healthy ones. They can be identified by mature or secondary defense mechanisms and an integrated sense of self. Again, who are you is a question they can answer in its complexity. Neurotics, of, uh, neurotics use primary defense mechanisms as well as mature ones. They are able to use the mature ones, such as intellectualization, repression, displacement, sublimation. Neurotics are in touch with reality and have an observing ego. In therapy, they are able to observe themselves and their motivations and actions. Why did I do it? Why was the, that important to me are questions the observing ego can answer. And last but not least, they have a lower intensity and transference. In a therapeutical context, context, transference refers to the transference of emotions, wishes and hopes onto the therapist. These feelings are meant for early caregivers, yet they are transferred to the ther therapist. The main goal of psychoanalysis or psychodynamic therapy is to uncover those unconscious mechanisms. A patient will, for example, constantly seek for the approval of the therapist or will blame the therapist for not being there for him or her or neglecting the patient. The process of transference is terribly human and normal. We unconsciously redirect our emotions from our parents in the past onto the people in the present like our partners, colleagues, or friends. And you can find a wonderful video on transference by the School of Life on YouTube. Uh, and again, last but not least, according to Erickson, neurotics are those humans who have successfully transversed the first two stages of psychosocial development. Neurotics have basic trust and basic autonomy. They rather have conflicts apart from these topics. The psychotics are at the far end of the spectrum. They could be referred to as the terrified ones. So why are they terrified? It's because their topics are those of existential terror, life and death, terror versus safety. It is often mentioned that psychotics tend to die in their dreams on a regular basis. This deep terror is not only hard for the patient, but also for the therapist due to transference and counter-transference. Yet, psychotics will never say this ter terror out loud. The fear might be seen by the fact that they still live with their parents or that they express it through their art. But the patient unconsciously transfers the feel his feelings or her feelings of terror and death onto the therapist. And the therapist often feels exhausted as a mother would be with her child. The patient evokes motherly qualities, yet exhausting feelings of nurture. This is the phenomenon of countertransference. Psychotics use immature defense mechanisms. Often denial, distortion are used, as well as projection, severe withdrawal and omnipotent control which leads to a gross impairment of reality testing. Often magical thinking can be observed, which refers to the absurd connection in the patient's life. A pain might be gone because the neighbor's cat just died, or the patient feels responsible for an earthquake in Sri Lanka because he or she had a bad thought the night before. They have difficulties with their identity. Who am I? How do I know I exist are troubling questions. The inner world is disorganized and a scattered personality structure is present. As they talk to the therapist, no red line is going through their life. The therapist mostly knows bits and pieces and has a hard time to bring it all together. 
they are deeply damaged. And at last, they lack the observing ego to observe their actions and motivations. Therapy with these patients is long and, and exhausting, often extending five years and often being lifelong. Now that we've learned about the healthy and the terrified one, let's take a look at the borderline spectrum, or the one that's caught in the middle. I hate you, don't leave me. It's one of the sentences which describes the borderline. Borderline patients have difficulties with their identity. Like psychotics, identity causes a problem for them. But two main differences are present. First, in contrast to psychotics, they know that they exist. And secondly, borderlines also struggle with the question, who am I, as well. They don't know what describes them. Borderlines have difficulties with their identity. If they are questioned about it, they tend to be hostile and aggressive. They explode or overreact when confronted with these questions. And you might say, well, but that's not a difference. The same is true for psychotics. And you're right, but there's one difference. Borderline patients are fixated in the separation individuation pro the process, the reapproachment phase. They know they are a person, but don't know which person or what individual they are. Psychotics will never even enter this phase, because they are never truly separated due to their existential terror. Borderlines lack the existential terror, but they have a basic defect in their sense of self, and split their identity into good and bad. And this splitting already brings us to their defense mechanisms. Denial and projection, projection identification are often used, yet the most distinct is splitting. It is so characteristic for borderlines that the DSM-4 uh, mentioned it for borderline personality disorder and characterizes it as a pattern of unstable and intense personality interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of idealization and devaluation. These mechanisms lead to the problem of reality testing. A borderline's reality often does not match the observing reality. So let's summarize. Three questions need to be kept in mind. Does the patient have an integrated self? Is the client in touch with reality? And what, does, and what def defense mechanisms does the patient use? You can pause the video to look over the chart and compare the spectrums. And here again is my source. The presentation was mainly based on Nancy McWilliams book, Psychoanalytic Diagnosis. And um, many lecture notes from our student group presentations. Thanks for listening and keep in mind we're all on the personality spectrum. Don't start analyzing your friends. Keep having fun together. And if you enjoy our lectures, visit our website psgriga.org and subscribe to us.